I am a solutions architect for PPL. I'm just going to run you through a little bit of information about who's PPL, what do we do, a bit of our data science journey that we've just embarked on. Delia's going to walk you through the projects that she's worked on and started putting together for us, and then just a little bit about our plans for the future. So PPL, we are a, license, a music licensing company established in 1934. We exist to ensure that those who make music uh, are basically paid fairly for their work. Uh, we license recorded music that's played in public. So we deal with bars, shops, um, radio, TV, broadcasters, all of that. We gather up that licensing revenue and we work on getting that distributed back out to our performer and rights holder members. So what does that actually mean? Why is that interesting? Well, what we actually do day to day when it comes down to it is that we are a data business. While our revenue comes from licensing music, we don't have any physical product that we sell. We don't deal with digital assets or anything like that. What we really do is we store and manage large amounts of metadata. So we have data for our 90,000 members made up of rights holders and performers. Uh, these members, they really are the reason that we exist as a company. And they are here to make music and we are licensing that music that they have. So we have a repertoire database with over 10 million recordings growing every day. And again, like I said, we don't have all the audio, although we're thinking of moving in that direction in the future. But we hold a lot of metadata information that I'll go into a bit further after. Um, we license that music out to a huge number of broadcasters, lots of shops, hairdressers, nightclubs, all of that. Um, that's uh, 380,000 uh, public performance venues. And then we also have a lot of reciprocal agreements with music licensing companies around the world, whereby we protect their repertoire for them and they protect ours for us. So, why did we decide that we wanted to embark down a path of data science? A lot of the reasons for us wanting to get involved in this are going to be familiar. There are a lot of the reasons that drive all the companies around. We have large, large data volumes. Not as large as everyone, but certainly for us, they're continuing to grow and we have to do a lot of data quality work on all of this data. So, I've talked about our repertoire. OK, it's, it's about 11 million recordings at the moment. Not crazy numbers, but we've received 919,000 recordings so far this year. So that's about 7,500 recordings a day. And that's up from last year, where we were receiving 4,500 recordings a day. So the rate at which data is coming in is just getting bigger and bigger and bigger with streaming with lower barriers to entry. Anyone can make a recording in their bedroom. They're all registering them. Everybody wants to get out there, get a stream, get a play. And it just means that in order for us to keep up, it's going absolutely crazy. And we have to be more efficient with the way that we work. Um, so we're addressing these uh, problems of high volume, low value. Sorry, I'm just trying to figure out how the, uh, <laughs> how the whole computer thing works here. <laughs> yeah, so almost all of the data that we hold at PPL is a very heavily skewed, long tail distribution. You know, we have Adele, we have Ed Sheeran, and they earn a huge amount of money. But you could see we have 60,000 performer members, and the vast majority of them are not earning Adele money. Um, this we can compare across our recordings as well. We have generally, remember off the top of my head, yeah, so the top 5% of our recordings generally earn 90% of the money. 
and then we have a very long, long tail of low value recordings. And I say low value, you know, we're coming at this from a kind of commercial sense. But the people that made those recordings, the people that played on those recordings, even if they're only earning five pound, one pound, 50p, that still matters to those people. And they're still our members, and we're very keen to make sure we can do the best that we can do with all of that. <coughs> and efficiency. We are looking to be as efficient as possible. So all organizations want to do this, but particularly at PPL, we behave like a commercial organization, but at the heart of it, we are a member organization. We are owned by our members and we do not retain any kind of profit. So every bit of money that we get in, we pay back out. This means the more money we spend on trying to improve the accuracy of our data is ultimately money that we're not paying out to our members. So we've always got that delicate balance of trying to get it as correct as possible for them so they get their money, but also making sure we don't spend all of their money in the process. So where do we start? We've decided we have a bunch of data. We want to work better with it. We want to work smarter. Let's get ourselves a data scientist. Great. What are we going to do now? So if we take one of our, one of our basic pieces of data, our recordings, they're quite central to a lot of what we do. I'm going to just show a very basic example of a Simple recording, simple data, looking nice. So you've got a Beatles song here, Hard Day's Night. We're going to store information like the title. We've got the name of the band, the Beatles. We have a recording date. There will be other information at that sort of level of granularity. Where was it recorded? What country? Uh, what country commissioned it? That type of thing. We also include the relationship between a recording and one of our rights holder members. So the Beatles, all of their repertoire is currently owned by Universal Music Group. That's a very simple example. You know, rights can be quite complicated. People buy and sell them. They start for different periods. They cover different types of use. But at a basic level, that's the kind of thing we're looking at. And then we're very interested in the lineup, uh, the performers. Who is it who performed on these recordings? So in many ways, for a lot of people, they think it's quite simple. Well, who is in that band? We, know, we all know who's in the Beatles. Great, just put whoever is in the Beatles on the recording, pay them, and we're done. But the reality is, even in this very simple scenario, you're trying to remember, actually, John Lennon is featured. That relates to the contract that he has with the record company. He's featured and he does vocals, also guitar. Paul McCartney, vocals and bass. And you get through the Beatles and then you get down to the bottom and you realize, actually, Hard Day's Night had a little funky little uh, piano solo on there. That was actually played by George Martin, often known as the fifth Beatle, and their producer. Because he's not an actual contracted member of the Beatles, we have to identify his sort of performance differently as a non-featured. This is a reason of, well, this is about as simple as it gets for the structure of the data. We ha also have to deal with the fact that we have these 10, 11 million recordings, and we want to get as close to that full correct data for all of them. Because without this data, we're unable to actually get the money from the people who have paid to use it on the radio, on TV, all the way out to the people who played and made that music. So what other types of challenging example do we have? Uh, orchestras. Orchestras have huge memberships. They have uh, changing lineups over time. You know. One year a violinist is in, another year they're out. Conductors are changing, different soloists. Um, and trying to keep track of that over time. Sometimes one section will be on one recording, but they're not on another. 
we have session musicians. Uh, just to give one example, there's a session player who no one will have heard of. I certainly hadn't before I joined uh, PPL. But she's played viola on over 12,000 recordings in our database for 1,600 different artists. Some of those covering Take That, Amy Winehouse, Pet Shop Boys, Bjork, Fat Boy Slim. That's not something typical that you would expect. That's a completely different type of challenge to understand, well, where is this type of performer going to turn up and how can we make sure they are where they should be. Another challenging area of our data, sampling. You know, once somebody samples a record and puts it onto theirs, from our perspective, all the people that played on the original sample, they are now on the new recording. So from our perspective, they're now performers on the new recording. So that's a whole path that you have to track back through, understand who they are, how are we going to get them on there. At the moment, with our policy decisions, um, we go with the whole song. It, <laughs> yeah, keeps it a bit simpler. So that's a fairly broad problem. How are we going to? approach that, how are we approaching this problem to try to move forward and use some of these data science techniques? Uh, our, reper our repertoire data comes from a variety of sources. So we're owned by our membership, and our membership own the repertoire. Therefore, they supply it to us, and we get varying degrees of quality and completeness of this data. Researching lineup information can be very, very labor-intensive. A lot of the people in the team will take similar approaches to what most of you would. They'll go in, they'll Google it, head off to Wikipedia, see who is in the band. There are various other crowdsourced uh, databases on the internet. And then we also have a lot of specialist knowledge, so people who happen to know a vast amount about classical music, People who have contacts within the music industry are able to phone up a manager and say, hey, what was the uh, session bass player you got in on that track? We're really trying to complete the lineup here. So we decided we wanted to build a recommendation engine to really increase the efficiency of these teams that we have doing our data quality work. We wanted to use analytics to assist them to be more productive to automate the work that could be easily automated, um, and to free up their time to be able to focus on what they're good at. There are things that an algorithm is going to do much, much better than a guy who has a load of music industry contacts. And there's a guy with a lot of contacts who can do things that an algorithm just can't do. So obviously, we're going to apply some technology to this. Um, I'm solutions architect, so great, we got through the solution, uh, got through the problem. What are we going to use to address this? We've got Python, Python's great. Um, when we're looking at our data quality in this situation, whilst I'm talking numbers like 10 million recordings, ultimately what we're doing is we're doing a lot of comparison throughout that. So while 10 million may not sound a lot, once you start to do Cartesian joins on all that data back onto itself to compare all the way across, actually, now you're t starting to deal with quite large volumes of data. So we started using um, Spark and HDFS to try and churn our way through that data. And then presentation at the end, we're using a BI product called Burst that we use to manage that data, push it into Redshift, and then ultimately visualize it and push it back. Uh, that's the toolkit that I gave um, Delga, our data scientist. And now she'll give you a bit of an explanation about what she did with that. Thanks, Mike. Um, can everyone hear me? Um, so. Um, 
just a little bit of introduction. Uh, I'm Delga, and I'm data scientist at PPL. Before this, I worked as a software engineer, but I've done data analysis for over 10 years. Uh, but this is something that really excites me, music. And um, looking at the quirks of the data, I wanted to present here because uh, I know some of these problems are common across all types of companies. Some of these are very specific and have to be kind of bespoke. Um, and it's kind of my journey through solving a particular problem. So what is the goal here? Uh, which performers are likely to have contributed to a recording? And that's basically uh, the goal of the recommendation engine. So the first intuitive solution that I thought of was collaborative filtering, of course. Um, collaborative filtering, take an example of Amazon. We don't observe all preferences, we just observe choices. So we want to recommend consumers who didn't purchase certain products, the products that they similar, similar consumers purchased. So applying it to this problem, uh, performers who have collaborated intensely, they're likely to be on each other's recordings. So here, for example, A and B are recordings, uh, performer one and two have both featured on it, so you're likely to add performer one to recording C. And then I thought, that's great, that's easy. Um, there were some difficulties with that. So when you come and uh, sort of try to apply your uh, algorithm, uh, whether it's machine learning or just statistics, you come to learn that actually some of that doesn't really apply. So I'll give you an example. Um, Adele, we all know who she is. Um, interestingly, with music, there's no real unique identify of an entity. So as an example with Adele, there are actually two Adeles. There's French Adele and there's uh, British Adele. So how do you make sure that a song by Adele, who, who is exactly on it? Um, the second example is um, there's a, obviously you guys know Hello, but an instrumental version of Hello may not actually feature Adele as a vocalist. So even if we listeners identify that song as by Adele, we don't want really to kind of infer, uh, assume that she's on it. Um, continuing on my journey, I came across Black Sabbath. Um, so, well, I knew Black Sabbath before, but um, so here is a particular release uh, called Born Again. And say a new recording comes in called uh, Stonehenge, it's on this release. And we want to make sure that we add core members of Black Sabbath to that recording. Uh, here's an example of good uh, data point and a bad data point. So a good data point, I'll just go line by line, a good data point will have the, uh, the uh, title. A bad po data point will actually have loads of different irrelevant stuff in there. So it could say featuring someone like Black Sabbath. Um, it could say what is the version of that. It could be instrumental, album, LP. So it's quite hard to sort of uniquely match based on the title itself. The date, the date is very, very important. So the original, the actual recording was uh, recorded in 1983. And that's, uh, by that time, Ozzy Osbourne has already left the band. So you want to make sure that the date is correct so that you can add the relevant people. Uh, just a very quick one, uh, release. Release is basically a product. You can have many different products, so it's very non-unique. You can have many misspellings like Black Sabbath. Um, now, this is, a, this is the reason why collaborative filtering may not work here. We have many recordings where we don't have lineup. So who is exactly similar to an empty set? Um, you want to make sure that you have a tool which you can apply to all sorts of things using the metadata. And the interesting thing about our data is that we have huge number of sources, very noisy, and ability to kind of find patterns within that pushes us to the limit. The underlying problem is of entity disambiguation. So you have Axel Rose, you have different aliases of Axel Rose. On the right, you have sort of the first image on Google for each of these aliases. So 
I don't know what Google does, but I don't think they have a unique dictionary of all the aliases of Axel Rose, and they probably don't because the first image would be probably similar if that was the case. It's a hard problem, but having access to metadata and different data sources can actually help you solve these problems. A uh, few more challenges uh, I encountered. Band membership changes over time. I mentioned there's many time, there are many times when contributors are not there. It's an empty set. Finally, we want to make sure that we add everyone who is on that track. We don't want to have, we don't want to miss someone who's very relevant. So a recommendation engine is not the only tool. We use third party sources. We also support uh, industry-wide standardizations uh, to make sure that actually when we exchange data uh, with many different sources, it comes in the format that we want and we can analyze. But I focus here purely on the recommendation engine. So through this journey, I found that insights, very quick sort of statistical um, sort of summaries actually are very, very helpful before diving into uh, designing the product. So as we've seen, names are very important. You want to make sure that a, re a recording metadata comes in and we want to be able to identify that it's by Black Sabbath. Um, in order to do that, I needed to create a dictionary of real entities and their aliases. So in order to do that, you need to normalize the names, whether it's a recording title, whether it's a band artist name, and in order to do that, you need to be able to kind of identify patterns. And one of the things that we understood early on is that there are these connectors. So these connectors can be something like featuring with, AKA, these kind of tokens that occur very commonly and um, kind of signal that there is more than one real entity in there. But it's difficult because you have certain tokens that can be actually part of the band name so Earth, Wind and Fire is actually a band, and if you separate by a comma and, and, you end up with three entities. So you want to make sure that you can solve these problems. What about, so the way I approached it is, have, do they actually sort of, I created a very high quality set of entities, and I searched whether any combination is within that dictionary. There's another problem that happens, which is above and beyond. There is a band called Above and Beyond, there's a band called Above, and there's another band called Beyond. So how do you make sure that you can get rid of that? So once I've sort of solved through these problems, um, these are kind of very music specific, but I bet you, know, you can probably apply these to many different problems. After that, I tried to understand a little bit more about typos and here I applied many different techniques in TF, IDF with clustering, fuzzy matching, and what I understood with names is that order of the characters is very important, so fuzzy matching for me turned out to be the best. Okay, so, you know, there, there are these stop words, but you know when you're working with people, names that come from creative industries, they don't really have a limit to how they can name, so you have like bands like check, 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 and when you get rid of the punctuation, it's just empty. So you wanna, you, you can't really have proper stop, stop words. You can't have, get rid of anything in there that's re relevant. So once we've identified that that recording was by Black Sabbath, what do we do now? A bit of code. Um, this is just a function in Python that normalizes the, um, a name, very music specific. So. How do we actually apply this in Spark? So in Spark, the first line is just saying, hey, let's load the data. Um, there are two ways in which you can apply that function. So one way is column-wise, the other is row-wise. And it all depends on what you want to do. So just a very sort of quick lesson here is that it's better to use data frames because they are kind of optimized already built in into Spark. Um, however, they don't give you as much flexibility as transforming the data into RDD. Um, I'm not gonna go through this, but I will put these slides and 
these are some of the lessons that I've learned through using Spark. Uh, a lot of the performance issues can be solved through uh, configuration and settings. And actually, just doing this, I was able to finish everything, all the fuzzy matching, all the recommendations within three to four hours when it wasn't able to load. As a data scientist, you, you want to be able to visualize to see if your algorithm is giving you some very obvious errors. So I use the tool called Gephi. Uh, the first graph is basically, I don't think you can see it very well, but um, you have clusters. The middle of the cluster is a band parent. So it's kind of the real entity. And branching off are the aliases. So here, for example, you will see the biggest cluster is some Hungarian Czech guy whose name is misspelled like a thousand times. Um, the right-hand graph is uh, actually collaborations between different entities. And you can also see, interestingly, with Gephi, you can automate the clustering. So all these, there's this huge cluster here, and when you zoom in, you'll be able to see that this is actually all classical music. So without doing anything complicated, you can actually detect some in interesting clusters. Okay, I'm not sure if I have time for that. Um, so now that we know it's by Black Sabbath, who are the stable members of Black Sabbath? Um, difficulty with that is that date can sometimes be misreported. So in that example that we just saw, so a 1983 track was misreported as being in 1979. How do you get rid of that problem? The basic thing is outlier detection. This doesn't get rid of all the problem, but it can get rid of a big chunk of the problem. Um, interestingly, you have outlier detection in a, in a kind of a creative industry in the sense that each of the bands and artists have their own activity. So sometimes, you know, career of a musician is not as linear as you would hope. They can go off and do something else, come back. So how do you, within that distribution, detect outliers? The first thing I did was bootstrapping the distribution, finding out what is in the top 5%, what is in the bottom 5%. But then I realized you would be detecting kind of outliers for every artist. So you want to make sure that you cluster the artists before you do that kind of outlier detection. Okay, so I sort of want to go a bit more in detail, but I don't think I have time. Um, once you identify bands sort of proper activity, uh, you can now start thinking about what is core member. The first thing that came to my mind when you think of a core member of a band is how long have they been in the band. But if you have very noisy data, it's very difficult to have kind of um, very smooth transition and being able to detect the duration of that person in the band. Also remember you have remixes, remasters, and all of this stuff coming in where the person may not be in there. What, what did I do? So for each year, I looked at the most common so the performers who are in most tracks, that's kind of your second uh, intuitive solution is, who is in most of the tracks? Recordings, sorry. Once you kind of detect core member for that particular year, you can do that for every year. And then you sort of have a lineup for each year. Then what I did was I clustered the years using, um, as you probably all know, uh, sklearn. Uh, Python uh, library, and within that we have this really nice, robust um, clustering technique, dbscan. So you can kind of cluster years with similar lineup. When you do that, you come across this kind of problem where these are different years and you have memberships, and you kind of have that problem where, you know, you, you kind of see a break here where you have a whole different member. Uh, membership of the band, and you have sort of like A in here. But this B pops up here, can pop up here, and you want to kind of make sure that you're smoothing that very well. Yeah. 
almost finishing. Um, with that, once you detect the Black Sabbath main members, you, I got this uh, output. So then I can actually do the recommendation. So, you know, uh, that was a 1983 track, so make sure Iommi Butler, Ward, and Nichols are recommended to be added. Uh, just one more minute, if I have. Um, we are looking into look, um, we're looking into using graph database and graph processing. So the next steps are for me Neo4j, Apache Spark, GraphX, and these are some of the things that we can do to capture very complex relationships. If you're interested in talking to me or Mike at the end of the presentation or later, please feel free. And I, I would love to have your suggestions. <coughs> Hi, thank you. That, that was a great uh, talk. I love music. Um, just one question, can you stop Ed Sheeran? Um, or more specifically, could you stop him for a Galway girl and send a message to him that he shouldn't get any royalties for that? <laughs> Is that possible? I'm afraid we, uh, we only show up to identify what's happened, make a record of it, and uh, propagate out the truth. Okay, uh, so you're not to blame. We're, um, we're not, unfortunately. We just get the data in and do what it tells us. An interesting case I think might be something like the Sugar Babes who started out and they've completely changed their lineup over the years and I guess your your timeline technique would would work for somebody like that is that right yeah so Sugar Sugar Babes is an interesting example because this was actually one of the first that we thought of as very uh, band membership changing so drastically over a year to year yeah. and um, it, you know we try to solve it through using this clustering but obviously there are so many things there that can go wrong um, and you know it's it's an ongoing problem, you know. And when you have a metadata, you want to make sure that you can kind of assign what is the truth to certain parts. And unfortunately, with music data, w with any music data, it's very hard to know what is the truth. So it's kind of very hard to, for you to get to the point to get the training data. Even it's a very difficult problem, but we're we're working on it. Uh, just a minor comment on my question. I guess you don't take in, the minor comment is I guess you don't take into account you know Axl Rose replacing the lead singer in ACDC when he went on tour because I guess he didn't do any recording, so that would be unnecessary complication. Well, until they come out with a yeah. live recording from a the recording, tour. Recording exactly. <laughs> uh, so my question is, do you find uh, Music Brains useful their API, and do you have an API? Um, we don't have an API. We're still quite early on this. Um, Music Brains is something that we brought in uh, while we were doing this work, and we had a look at that. Uh, we've, we found it wasn't particularly useful in terms of they don't have great lineup information. Uh, we've also been looking at Discogs. So both of those, rather than APIs, we've downloaded their full data set and um, dropped them into uh, RDS. So you didn't find their unique IDs um, useful? If it was on songs or on artists? It, it's something we're continuing to look at. Um, mm -hmm. There's definitely something in it for helping us to cluster and helping us identify the actual entities. Um, it's still early days for us. There's just so much data out there trying to get on top of it all. Is, uh, mm -hmm. I Thank you. I'll Excellent talk. I add to that, I think Discogs is doing a really good job of crowdsourcing, and we have been able to detect some really interesting uh, patterns in Discogs. And through that, we're kind of going to another level of you know, trying to actually understand the nature of collaborations and things like that with all this metadata. Um, so Discogs probably is a better source than Music Brains, in my opinion. Thank you. Also been looking at the Spotify API because they do quite a good job of identifying entities and collaborations. Any more questions? No. Okay. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Thank you.